How's it going, everybody? Come on! <laughs> Are you guys excited to be here? I know, it's Monday morning. We rubbed the tube, it's bad. But uh, we're really excited to have you guys here. I want to welcome you all to TwilioCon uh, Europe. And this is the first time we've done TwilioCon Europe. And we are really excited because we view TwilioCon as the home of software people and the home of doers. And we know there's a whole lot of software people and a whole lot of doers here in Europe. So we are really excited to bring TwilioCon here. And as a, one of the special, uh, uh, special news items for TwilioCon, because you're here, you get to be clued into a little, uh, little secret of ours. And that secret is there's a little Easter egg in every press release that we've ever done. Every story, every quote we've ever given to the press. And that Easter egg is this. I end my quote in the press release with the words, we can't wait to see what you build. We can't wait to see what you build. And that is absolutely the truth. Because we are astounded every day by what you guys are doing. How you guys are using software and how you guys are using Twilio, the power of communications, to build amazing things in the world. We can't wait to see what you build. And so it's great to have you here in person today to meet you and talk about the things that we're building. So I wanted to start out by focusing on a small handful of you guys in our community who've been building some amazing things in the past year. We call them doers. And doers are people who pick up their tools and get building and solve problems. And we want to highlight just a few of the extraordinary stories that have happened in our community in the past year. So first up, I wanted to introduce Sam Hill, Tom Armitage, and Georgi Galik, uh, who are the creators of Hello Lamppost. Sam, Tom, and Georgi have built this amazing thing. They're working to re-engage the city of Bristol through the power of communications. Now, I've got to show you how this thing, this thing works. It's really cool. Hello Lamppost lets you communicate with forgotten items. Everyday items around the city now have a phone number and a code that you can text to interact with other people who've been at that spot as well. And you can see the messages that people have left there about a lamppost or a post box or a park bench. And you can now interact with these items. And what they're really doing is reinvigorating people's connection to their city and to their environment and connecting people together in an amazing way, bringing the city to life. Let's hear it for Sam, Tom, and Georgi. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> next up, our next doer, Tim Rogers of Go Cardless. Tim's a support rep and a developer and a student. You guys may know Go Cardless. It's a platform. It's the easiest way to take debit payments on your website. And when Tim joined as a customer support rep, he realized that they needed a better way to track metrics of what was going on within their customer support. So being a doer, he built the thing he calls Node Phone. And it's built with Twilio, Node.js, and Socket.io. And it lets them accept phone calls, as they were before, from their customers for customer support. But now they can track all sorts of metrics and all sorts of data and sh show on the screen for the customer support rep, the customer's name, their transaction history, all sorts of information about them, and really create a great customer experience, but also provide uh, information about what, uh, uh, provide information about uh, the data that they need to improve that customer experience every day. Let's hear it for Tim. Yeah. Next up, we've got Michael Fitzgerald of One Page CRM. He is the CEO and the founder of this company based in Dublin. In fact, One Page CRM is the first recipient of the Twilio Fund EU investment prize powered by 500 startups and Dave McClure. So Michael uh, built this company and it's a very interesting story, right? It's designed to make day-to-day -day sales processes very easy. And I can show you, we've got some screenshots. Instead of the complicated CRM people are used to, this makes the job of a salesperson really easy because they can see exactly what they need to do to stay in contact with their customers in a really easy to use way. But it's amazing how this product came to be. Uh, they initially built this for themselves. It was part of another project they're working on. They built it for themselves and they realized it was so good that they started to give it to some of their customers. And the customers said, we love it. And one page CRM became their product. 
and became their whole focus. Uh, and one of the amazing things you can do from one-page CRM is call your sales leads right from inside the browser, right from inside the app, and track all that activity using Twilio. Let's hear it for one-page CRM and Michael Fitzgerald. <laughs> Next up, Ross Penman. He's a developer, and he is in the front row, and he is just 14 years old. And he's got an amazing story of what he built. So I don't know if you guys remember, uh, during the summer, this past summer, when Apple's developer site had a major outage. And uh, during that outage, uh, Ross, in two hours, built a site where developers could go sign up and get a text alert when Apple's developer center was back online. And in just 24 hours, he had over 1,000 developers who were signed up for those alerts. And what's amazing is that he built it in just a few hours, and he's only been coding for a couple of years. But at 14 years old, he's already built some amazing stuff. And uh, this is the future, right? Doers who pick up their tools and get building. So let's hear it for Ross. <laughs> and our next doer today, Max Little of the Parkinson's Voice Initiative. So this is an amazing project. Their team has collected over 10,000 phone call recordings of people both with and without the Parkinson's disease. And what they're doing is analyzing the voice patterns of these people to figure out how to decipher, using these voice patterns, decipher who has Parkinson's and use voice as a channel to do diagnosis of this horrible disease. And the goal is to enable better faster, more scalable clinical testing of people who may be diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease. And so using this data, using the power of communications and just the power of a phone call to give doctors a better clinical tool to diagnose this major disease is what they are working on. Let's hear it for the Parkinson's Voice Initiative and Max Little. And we have one more doer today. By the way, you're going to hear from a bunch of these guys because they're here giving talks today. Really excited. You'll hear their stories and hear how they built what they built. We've got one more doer today. He's not here today. Uh, he's from Canada, and his name is Roger Stringer. He's an author, an entrepreneur, and actually uh, he's a journalist and a cook. Um, and uh, one of the things that he did, he built, an, he built an app. It's called The Interviewer. And it's a website that helps journalists or HR people or bloggers schedule interviews via the phone, record those calls, and really organize the workflow of people who regularly do phone calls and uh, need to record and track those phone call conversations. But here's where it gets really cool. You know, he's a cook and he's a journalist, you know, before he built this site. He decided to write the Twilio cookbook, the definitive source of how to build cool things with Twilio. And he's built this book and he's published it the Twilio cookbook, and it is 60 recipes of how to do things like build voicemail, build a phone tree, uh, send text messages, and everything else. And what's really cool about this book, he just published it last month, and you guys are all getting a free copy of it today outside. So you can go pick up your copy today. Uh, and it's got these great recipes, things you probably never thought of doing with Twilio. He teaches you how to do in the Twilio cookbook. So that's Roger's story, and we're really happy that he built that. So let's hear it for Roger. And in fact, let's hear it for all of the doers in our community, in this room, outside this room, in Europe, and all around the globe who are building amazing things every day to solve the world's problems. Let's hear it. Like I said, we can't wait to see what you build is really true. People astound us every day with amazing things that they're building. And what's so cool is when we look at, you know, from our perspective, we can see the impact that your applications, the things you're building, the impact uh, these applications are having on the world. And so I wanted to share some of those statistics, some of those metrics that, that show the impact that you and your applications are having on the world. So last year at uh, TwilioCon in the US, we shared the fact that uh, applications built on Twilio had reached 145 million people around the world. And this year, that number has grown to over 350 million people around the world have been touched by Twilio applications. So we are really excited about that. 350 million people. That represents about 20% of the global households have been touched by applications that have been built 
uh, on top of Trulia. And uh, furthermore, here in the UK, which we came here about two years ago, the applications built here have reached nearly 25% of all UK adults. That is amazing. In just two years, you guys have reached a quarter of the adult population of the UK. Another interesting uh, stat that we look at, you know, a year ago, we announced that half a billion phone calls had been made using the Twilio platform for all sorts of use cases. And here we are just a year later, and that number is over 1.5 billion phone calls have been made on behalf of your applications. That's a lot of reach, and it means the things you're building are very meaningful. If you break that down on a daily basis, it's even more interesting. So on an average business day, you know, we, we released this last year, the number of calls made has grown significantly to a year ago, 1.4 million calls per day on the average business day. And in 2013, that has now grown to over 4 million calls per day. So again, you show the impact of the apps you guys are building is amazing. You know, another interesting metric we look at is Frequently, uh, people use us for call center technology. Call centers, right? And frequently, there's, uh, uh, there's the need for compliance purposes to record those phone calls. And a year ago, we announced that over 100 million minutes of call recordings were stored by Twilio. And now, just a year later, that is 270 million, over half a billion minutes of call center recordings are now stored on Twilio for your applications. But it's not just voice, it's text messages as well. Text messages as well. And so before TulioCon Europe ends this evening, you guys are gonna send text messages. Your applications are gonna reach subscribers in 198 countries. That's amazing. Every country, I mean more countries than the United States at least officially recognizes, you are going to send messages to. And if you took the content of those text messages, those 160 characters, and you combine them all together, that by the end of today, you are going to have enough content that would fill over 1,600 copies of the Financial Times. That's a lot of content. That's five years worth of the Financial Times that you guys are going to fill before the end of today in 160 character increments. That's amazing. So we are just astounded, astounded by the impact your applications are having. In fact, we frequently looked at the, the traffic growth, right, of what people are doing. We see these spikes that go on. In fact, you know, a couple of years ago, we saw a spike in the uh, fall of 2010. And we said, what's going on? Is this just a fluke? Is there something going on? This is going to surely taper off. And you know what happened is we saw it continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. And then last fall, we saw a similar thing, a huge spike in traffic. We said, this is a fluke, right? This is going to this is going to fall back down. But you know what happens? It keeps on growing. And as we sit back and we look at this, we say, what is going on? Why are these developers' applications continuing to grow and grow and grow and surprise us with all sorts of new use cases and people around the world interacting with these applications? And when we start to realize, when we look at all of these applications, the breadth of them, and their continued growth and their continued traction in the market with you know, your customers, what we're seeing is that software is redefining communication. That's what this means. That's what this growth is. We are witnessing, and those graphs are showing, software redefining what communications means. So we'd have to take a step back and think about why is this? Why is this the case? You know, and one of the things that's interesting about our company is that we serve software people. Right? We are software people. We serve software people. And when us collectively, when we think about software people, we think about the world differently. Software people, we see the world differently. And when we see software changing communications, it's just like software is changing so many industries because of the mindset of software people. Let's take a look at a few of those industries, right? Because it's really interesting to see what us, software people, what we're doing to the world. Let's start with one industry, television. Right? Many of us have a remote that looks like that for our cable box. And what's so interesting is this is what not software people build, right? It's got 137 keys on it. And everything that this remote will ever do is baked into that remote on the day it rolled off 
the assembly line. That's hardware. But you know what software people do when they tackle an industry? They build a remote that looks like this. The Apple TV remote, it's only got a few buttons on it. Why is it? Why would it only have a few buttons? It's simple, it's easy, but more importantly, what it does is it preserves the flexibility of software to go into the box, the Apple TV box that gets updated all the time with new software, new content, new capabilities. It is always updated, that's the power of software. It's not baked into the hardware. Let's look at another example, payments, right? We've seen this at every corner store, and every lunch spot, everywhere around the world, right? This box that, that does payments with credit cards. And again, look at all those keys, look at the printer, look at all that's in there. The only thing this box will ever do is what it was designed to do when it rolled off the assembly line. But now look at what software people do when they attack the problem of accepting payments by merchants. Right? You get companies like Square, who are software people. Their hardware is just that tiny little plastic dongle, and everything else is preserved. The power of software is preserved, and they can update that software every day if they want to. <coughs> add new features, add new functionality, be responsive to their customers, fix bugs. They're agile, they can do this quickly because they preserve the power of software. Well, let's look at a whole other industry software people are taking over. A place I wouldn't have expected to look, right? Your car, right? Most of our cars, we have the same car that we drive every day <coughs> until one day when we buy a new car and we trade it in, right? But that's not true for some people. That's not true if you own a Tesla. Teslas are rolling pieces of software. They get over-the-air updates almost every week to add new features, new functionality, new capabilities, fix bugs, and make it a better car. All through the power of software. You don't have to buy a new car. You get a new car every week when they push a software update. That is amazing. That is truly amazing. What you see here are these companies, <coughs> Apple, Tesla, Square, they're harnessing the flexibility of software because software is infinitely flexible. And what companies like this, companies who are winning because they use that power of software to be responsive to their customers, that flexibility is competitive advantage. That's what's key. You can respond to your customers faster. And it's these companies, people like Apple and Tesla and Square, who are winning. It's this flexibility that is coming to define our age. The flexibility of software is creating the new winners in every single market and defining the companies we work with, defining our age of business. That's what's astounding. In industry after industry, every industry is going to become a software industry because of this. So what's interesting is when we talk to customers about the communications problems that they are trying to solve with their customers as it relates to communications, we see this common thread. But in all these other areas, flexibility is key. But you know what? Communications is just fundamentally not flexible. It's the opposite. Communications has been and has always been a very inflexible endeavor. Why? Why is that the case? Why is communication so inflexible? Well, it sort of goes back to how vendors have historically set up this industry. And it sort of goes back to that classic build versus buy decision, right? Everyone in you know, IT or R&D, we've all heard of this, build versus buy, right? It's the classic argument, the rumble in the jungle between build versus buy. And it's set up by vendors. This argument is set up by vendors. You know why? To make you feel like you're an idiot if you build. Why would you go reinvent the wheel when you can just buy it over here? You're not using your resources properly. It's not your core mission, right? Make you feel like an idiot if you choose the build option. Right? What they're saying essentially is it is bad to build. Building is bad. Buying is good. That's what this argument implies. You're an idiot. You've made the wrong decision if you built because you'd be reinventing the wheel. And that's, you know, it's, it's hard to argue with that actually. Because if you look at what it takes to stand up the ability to communicate, 
It's this very complicated stack. It starts with connecting the carriers, then hardware that can talk to that connectivity, and then software protocols, and then an application stack sitting on top of that for something like a call center, or an IVR, or a PBX, or even just texting, right? It's this complicated stack that starts at carriers, and hardware, and software, and then an application on top. And of course, these things don't all work together. They're from four different vendors, so what do you do? You bring in professional services all around, contractors, agencies, come in, integrate the things, make them all work, contract after contract, every time you want to do a new thing. That's how it works in this industry, right? And then you slap a bow on it, and you call it a solution. Congratulations, you just bought a solution. The irony is, you wrote more code, and you did more custom development in this world than if you just built it yourself, like most things that we do. Because right, this thing is cobbled together by contractor for contractor, writing glue, and the thing becomes so fragile. You have a one-off. Every implementation is different. You want to make changes? Hire another contractor. Bring in more professional services. It's a money pit. We don't call that a solution at all. We don't like that. What we see as software people is something fundamentally different. What we at Twilio see is what we offer is this communications infrastructure. It's this logical piece where all that infrastructure lives. Then on top of that, we have this software abstraction layer, right? An API that separates the infrastructure from the software you're going to write to solve your business problem. And it's this clean separation of infrastructure from business logic, this sensical separation via an API that makes this work so well. So when we look at why is software redefining communications, it's because of this architecture that is fundamentally different from what this industry has done for 30 or 40 years. Right? That's why software is redefining communications. Sensible separation between what we do and what you do that lets us each focus on what we do best. But what's interesting is we're not alone in coming to this conclusion, that this is the right architecture going forward. Because we see this notion of software defined has been used now in multiple industries. Multiple industries have come to the same conclusion we have, right? You've got software defined networking, right? That separates the guts of networking gear and routing logic via APIs from the systems that need to control and reconfigure and reroute it and actually make the networking infrastructure more agile, more responsive to change. Right? We see a similar thing in the data center. The data center is now software driven. Right? Things like Amazon Web Services, where APIs allow you to configure and provision and reroute all on the fly using the power of software. Right? So what we're talking about here is software-defined communications. Right? Software-defined communications. It preserves the flexibility of software and lets you build applications that communicate. It empowers the software layer and empowers the software people to now be able to solve these problems without having to bring in contractor after contractor and vendor after vendor to make anything work. So just like Tesla, just like Apple, just like Square, what we're seeing now is software people are able to tackle the power of communications. Unlike when you have to go back and buy a new solution every time to bring in those contractors, teams inside of companies who embrace software-defined communications say yes to building, say yes to projects, say yes to being able to solve customers' problems because they know it's easy. They know it's not going to be a year or 18 months or 24 months to get anything done. You can say yes, we know how to do that. It's just the power of software. We don't have to go out and spend all this time buying. And so what's interesting is that the vendors who are out there selling these boxes, right, selling these lines and boxes and professional services to, to, to make all this stuff work, right, they're aware of this, these, these guys selling hardware. It's their bread and butter. Right? So they're aware of it, so they're not stupid. And so they're out there responding to the changing world, responding to the world of software. And it's interesting to see companies who are responding in various ways. Because we see the legacy vendors, people who provide hardware. People are trying to sell stuff into the closet. People who are make all their money by doing it that old way. Take these same, same old boxes. 
But they'll say, oh no, the cloud. People are talking about the cloud. Okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna take these boxes and we're gonna, we're gonna put them into our own data center and we're gonna call it the cloud, right? And we're gonna sell it and say it's the cloud, but you know what, it's the same old thing. It's the same old single tenant, single tenant infrastructure, just running in a different data center, right? That box, just because it's running on their CPU instead of yours, doesn't fundamentally change the nature of that solution. And that's one of the problems you run into. Another thing you see is these vendors that say, oh, software, we need APIs. Everyone's got APIs, right? So they'll slap an API on it. Slap an API on some existing single tenant solution. The problem is that doesn't solve the problem. You're still tied to the fundamental design decisions that they used when they built that solution in the first place. You don't get building blocks that let you compose an application like you do in truly in the world of software-defined communications. That's what you lose if you just try to slap software, slap an API, slap the cloud onto some existing solution. It doesn't work. You don't get the power. You don't get the flexibility. Now, I give these guys some credit right, for trying to reinvigorate stuff they already had, give it a new name. But you know what? It doesn't really cut it. It doesn't fundamentally change the architecture of what they're doing. Because software defined is that architecture. In fact, software defined is what is redefining communications. Software defined communications. That's the key thing. And so when you get back to that old build versus buy argument, you start to see like, wow, if you actually have a sensible architecture that you're building on, you know what? Finally, for the benefit of us and for the benefit of our customers, it is a good thing to build. And that's good. You know why? Because we're builders here. That's what we love doing as software people. We love solving customers' problems. Build is no longer a dirty word. Build is what we do. We pick up our tools and we get building and we can finally do that. That's why we're software people. That's why we're excited to be here today. So, one of the things that we've noticed in the past year, past couple of years, is people are building business critical apps on top of Twilio. Ones that touch your customers, ones that are critical to your customers' perception of your business and their support and their happiness. Business critical apps, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into building those apps. Right? You've got the life cycle of these apps. You're building them. You're trying to debug them. You're trying to support those after they're live. Where right? business critical apps have a lot of special needs. And so at Twilio, We've listened and we've come up with a bunch of tools that help you not just build, not just debug, but support your live production business critical applications. So I won't walk you through a, f a few of these things that we've been building. So we're really excited to see what developers have been doing and how they can use these tools to ultimately build better business critical applications. So first of all, when we thought about how people go about deploying changes to applications. Right, what's the typical way a developer or a DevOps or a SysOps person goes about deploying a change to an application, right? Well, they typically look at it and, uh, uh, and they say, well, let's just tail the log files. Let's see if it was successful, right? Yeah. Let's see how that deployment worked. Well, you know, to us, tailing the log files is not really our, it's not really our vision of deploying with confidence, right? <laughs> Throw it out there and see if it worked, right? And so one of the themes that we've been building towards is how you can deploy with confidence every single time you deploy your code. So last year we deployed something, uh, we launched something called the test API that lets you run your unit tests against Twilio's live APIs without incurring any charges, without actually sending messages. Um, that way you can run automated tests to improve your code uh, without, with, uh, before you deploy it, right? Run those automated tests. And so that was great. We launched that last year and developers have been using that a lot. And we see the quality of code, the quality of test coverage that our customers say they have because of this API has gone up significantly. So that's exciting. You get insights into how your code works before you deploy it. But you know what, there's another thing that, that we've noticed, right? Webhooks, the architecture of infrastructure in the cloud, communicating with your applications via webhooks, um, you know, those are hard to, to tell what's going on, right? So you have to instrument those things. And people end up putting print statements and you know, running the log files and their scripts just to see, hey, what was the webhook that came in and how did I respond to it? Right? That's hard, both during development and in debugging a live application to see what's going on. And you start to understand, yeah, you know what? You can't really debug what you can't see. Right? And so that's why we launched last month the Request Inspector. 
And the request inspector, which is live in everyone's account portal today, gives you visibility into the requests that are coming from Twilio into your app, as well as how your apps are responding to those requests. Every Twimmel web hook, you get the request, you get the response data, all without having to dig into your logs or dig into print statements or anything like that. And you can see it's got all the headers, all the, all the information you need to see what's going on in the cloud to help understand your app. But the other thing that's interesting about this, we, we log all that data, right? Everything about the request, the response, it's all there. But there's another part to it as well, which will let you turn it off in case your app has sensitive data that you want to make sure you don't expose to people. Uh, you know, developers in your organization, your production data, you can turn it off so Twilio will not log any of this information. Right? So both helping you debug your requests, but also keeping you secure while you are uh, managing those mission critical applications is what the request inspector is for. So we're really excited to, uh, to launch that last month because we know this is a, a huge part in how we can help you build better applications, both during your building phase and during your supporting phase. So that's really exciting. So when we think about uh, uh, deploying with confidence, one of the other things we're thinking about is how can we help you get to the bottom of, a, of an issue when it's happening? Right? So we all know what happens. We've all been there for developers. Right? There's some issue going on, a network line got split, you deployed some bad code. And what happens? Right? Your inbox blows up with alerts. You get 10,000 emails from some monitoring system telling you that something broke. And you're like, okay, how am I going to get to the bottom? I'm going to make sense of 10,000 emails to figure out what's actually happening here. And so we said our goal is to help you get to the bottom of it. Our goal is to help you make sense of that data. And so we launched something last month called the App Monitor. It gives you a consolidated real-time view of all the errors, all the notifications, everything that's going on in your Twilio account. So instead of seeing 10,000 things, you see one thing pointing to exactly what the issue is. Let me show you what it is. It helps you focus on what's most important. It's like a doctor for your application. Shows you all the data that we have about the, the errors and the notifications that are going on inside of your application. Tells you what's sick the minute you log in. Actually, it's more like a triage nurse showing you exactly where you need to focus your attention to fix a problem that's going on. So it's really cool. Instead of uh, taking those you know, 10,000 errors, you get, one, you get one screen that shows you what's going on. And it's all aggregated to show you in the quickest view possible what's happening in your application. Puts it all in context, right? That's what's key. That's what you need during a mission critical application deployment. You can see graphs and charts of the history of that error and say, oh, that correlated to that deployment of that code. You can see historically when you've had that issue. So that's the app monitor. That's live in your account today. We really hope you guys use the app monitor to really diagnose and help you build mission critical applications for your businesses. So the app monitor is, is great. It lets you log in and just see really quickly what's happening in your account. But here's another thing that we noticed. We said, hey, you know, if we've got all this data about you know, errors that are going on in your applications, why should we wait for you to have to come to us to see if there's a problem? And so we also launched app monitor alerts as a part of this product as well. What is this? Well, it lets you configure email or webhook alerts that we will proactively tell you when something's going on with your application. So you find out before your customers do, right? If your server's having trouble, if your database queries are slow, whatever it is, it's a proactive alert that goes out to you before your customers tell you that something is wrong. And you can set it up on uh, any error or configure individual errors. It's completely configurable so that you guys can do whatever you want to track for your applications. And of course, just like uh, everything in Twilio, there's an API. So you can configure this stuff on the fly from your applications or write your own dashboards to configure it however you want. This is a very useful API to use when you deploy. Think about it. You deploy software and you want to make sure that no issues pop up. You can use this API to alert you proactively in case your deployment introduces some kind of errors. So we've seen developers build some amazing things with app monitors and app monitor alerts to make sure that their applications are solid as they hope. And it's all part of our goal, to help you deploy with confidence, right? A number of things, the test API, the request inspector, the app monitor, and the app monitor alerts are all there to make sure that when you build apps, you can deploy them with confidence every time. So one of those areas that we've seen a lot of activity in these business critical applications, one of the major use cases where there's a ton of benefit has been the call center. 
You know, and the call center is this interesting uh, area for us. Why is that? Why is it so interesting? Well, when we talk to customers, here's what we find out. Call centers have this incredibly long 10-year uh, life cycle. Right? You buy a call center, that hardware, that software, that's going to live for 10 years. But that's not it, right? So if you got, let's say you launched a brand new call center in 2008. Right? So that's considered pretty much brand new by most standards in the call center space. Right? So if you launched it in 2008, it means you actually probably identified the problem because there's a two-year buying cycle. You identified the problem you're trying to solve in 2006. Right? The sales rep you talked to, he's selling you their flagship product. That thing was built and launched probably in 2003 because these things have long engineering cycles. So he's telling you their flagship product that was launched in 2003. By the way, that was designed and built on an architecture from 1998. So most call centers you see today are running at least 15-year-old technology. Like that's for a brand new modern deployment, spending millions of dollars. You're running something in that call center that's 15 years old. So we think it's time for a new architecture for call centers. One that's up to date. One that moves as fast as your customers do and as fast as your customer expectations are moving. Right? At Twilio, we didn't set out to be a call center vendor. Right? We're a platform. You can do many things on top of Twilio. But it <coughs> turns out that some of the most innovative call centers in the industry are being built on top of Twilio by you guys every day. The other thing that's most interesting about this is that none of these look exactly alike. There's a lot of different things, right? We've got Home Depot who's building call centers on top of Twilio to connect in-store shoppers with plumbers, electricians, people who can build stuff in your house right in the store. Right? We've got Hulu building call centers that span multiple continents, all with the click of a button. We've got Zendesk who's built an amazing call center that anyone can go sign up for for just 10 bucks a month per agent and you've got a call center ready to go in less than three minutes. Right? These are amazing examples of the next generation, the next face of what call centers are going to look like. But these guys are all based in, in the US. So I wanted to point to one of our customers who's doing some amazing things locally here. Uh, and that's Amigo Loans. And they just moved their uh, infrastructure. They moved offices. And they had a phone closet full of gear to power the call center. And when they moved, they said, you know what? We don't want to move that phone closet. We want to leave that phone closet behind. And in our new office, we're just going to use the cloud. So let's take a look now at what, uh, what they've built. Let's hear from James, the CEO and founder of Amigo Loans. The most important thing for us is people talking to people. You know, it's, it's when, when you answer a call, when you make a call, can we give our agent as directly as possible just the information that they need to have a personal communication or a personal relationship with that customer. And it's surprising how when you get 100 people and a half a million pounds worth of telecoms equipment and 100,000 customers, suddenly the humanity gets lost. You know? And, and that's, that's the fight for us always is, how do we get it to be like it was on day one? How do I get that same experience of I'm a person you're a person, you have a problem, I'm going to solve that problem for you without any of the complexity that's got in the way in the meantime. Everything in the industry, whether it's the way that we train call center agents, the way we, we market for customers, the way we churn through customers on a predictive dialer, is based on the idea that customers are numbers. What small companies know automatically, what a one or two or five person startup knows is that every single customer counts and you have to give an agent as far as possible the ability to deal with that customer directly. When we went to a number of different big telecom suppliers, you know, we said to them, these are the features that we need and we need APIs to build them into our system. And everything we looked at, it was going to be a training overhead, it was going to be a maintenance hardware overhead, there was obviously a, a capex cost that we didn't want to take, into a, uh, take in as well. But, but more than anything, it was, it was a layer of knowledge, of information that would have to be learned and, and worked with internally. For us, that's the most important thing in Twilio, is, is that it, it does what we need it to do and nothing more. And what that means is that our agents are able to do what the customer needs them to do and nothing more. 
So that's a great story by Amigo Loans because what they're doing is building their next generation of call centers with the goal of empowering their employees. Right, James talks about you build this, you know, you, if you build a way to do it, you buy a solution, but it, it actually is not geared towards solving your problems for your customers in a way that's intuitive for your employees, i.e. the employees are not empowered. So you can start to see why the call center is so interesting, right? Because it's the most critical touch point with your customers. Customers are calling into your call center when they're trying to buy something from you or when they're having a problem that they couldn't solve on their own. It's a critical touch point, and the old solutions aren't cutting it. And so the call center, if you really think about it, is not just one customer experience. It's two. Of course, first of all, you have the customer experience with your customer, the person who calls in. And they're maybe already frustrated, so you want to provide a great experience, right? I'm sure we've all had the typical experience, what you come to expect when you call a bank, a credit card, any of these guys, right? And you call in and you have an IVR and it says, what's your account number? For security purposes, what's your mom's dog's maiden name? Right, you answer all these questions. And then you finally get to a human being and what's the first thing they ask you? What's your account number? What's your mom's dog's name, right? And this is infuriating. It's because there's these silos built up that separate these systems and make it a bad customer experience. That's the customer experience we all know because we feel that every day when we try to interact with companies, right? But there's another customer experience as well. And that's the experience for the call center agent, right? The person sitting on the other end of that line who's got an equally bad situation when they're using 15-year-old technology, right? This is the Facebook generation most likely manning these phone lines. They're used to easy to use, iPads, iPhones, Facebook, click, 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 right? And then you put them in front of 15-year-old enterprise technology and you expect them to provide a good customer experience. We've all had that situation. You call an airline, right? I need to change my flight. Okay, I can help you with that. Click, 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 click for 15 minutes and they still haven't changed your flight, right? That's the effect of a bad agent experience, which results in a bad customer experience as well. When software lets down those agents, everybody loses. The customer, high turnover of the agents, nobody's happy. And that's what we see is so interesting about what people are doing. Is they're not just creating a better customer experience, but a better agent experience as well. And that results in higher retention, better customer service. Everybody wins. But you know what? There's another reason why the call center is so interesting as well. In addition to providing a great customer experience, when you add it all up, the cost of hardware, the cost of software, the cost of lines and training, and all of these things. Call centers are expensive. All those CapExes and OpExes, they add up very quickly. And Twilio customers running their call centers in the cloud last month alone saved over $7 million over their previous solutions. $7 million in one month. That's $100 million nearly this year is going to be saved by Twilio customers because they move their call centers and put them in the cloud. It pays to build a call center on top of Twilio, in addition to the great customer experience you're providing for your agents and your customers, right? So this is really cool. We didn't set out to be a call center company, but it turns out Twilio is an engine to provide great customer experiences. And that's because of some of the new technologies that we bring and let you build into your call centers. Things like SMS, WebRTC, SIP connectivity. These are the tools, these are the building blocks that you guys need to provide great customer experiences. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about one of these. Twilio Client with WebRTC. This is one of the most interesting developments in browser technology and in the call center in probably a generation. It's really cool. You saw Amigo Loans. You saw how they're dialing from right inside the browser and contacting customers. All they need to do is plug in a headset and a microphone, and an agent is live. In fact, we have a customer who sells call centers, and they will drop ship Google Chromebooks to your front door. And all you do is open the lid. And you know, those things boot up in like three seconds. Open the lid, plug in a headset, and three seconds later, your agent is live. All just within the browser, Google Chrome. 
Right? Compare that to spending 18 months and millions of dollars. Now a two or three hundred dollar PC, three seconds after you open it, you are live with a call center in the cloud. That is amazing. And of course, because of the flexibility of software, they can update it all the time to add new features, new functionality, make it a better experience every single day. And so when we look at Twilio Client and the adoption of Twilio Client for call centers, especially using WebRTC since we launched it just over a year ago, we've seen a tremendous amount of growth. In fact, through last year, this is what we had seen as far as the use of, of Twilio Client. It had grown significantly since we originally launched it in, in mid-2011. But since then, it has just exploded in the number of users of WebRTC and Twilio Client in the browser. And that's one of the amazing things uh, about what we see customers doing. You can deploy very quickly and grow very quickly. And all of these call center customers are doing it in the browser so that they can be fast, they can be agile, they can be nimble, provide a great experience. So when we think about what's happening in this call center, we see a lot of these people building, you know, some of these people building net new call centers. So like Amigo Loans, they said, we're going to throw away our old stuff, and we're going to build a brand new system running in the cloud. But there's another thing that's going on as well. A lot of these people are moving their infrastructure from the legacy, from the old stuff, to hardware sitting in a closet, to the power of software-defined communications so that they can start to leverage the power of the cloud. But what does it mean when you're in this transition period? We've got a big investment over here but you know that the future is over here. What well, means that you're gonna have a period of time where you've got hybrid infrastructure. You're a hybrid of your old on-prem and your new in the cloud stuff. So let's talk about SIP. Because SIP is how you bridge those two things together. A year ago we launched SIP out. It allowed you to connect from the cloud into your SIP infrastructure running in your closet. And a month ago we launched SIP in allowed you to bring your infrastructure and connect in to Twilio's cloud. So now we've got full duplex, we just call it Twilio SIP. It lets you connect either direction from your own infrastructure into Twilio and vice versa. So we're really excited about this. SIP, you know, voice over IP connectivity directly from the cloud into your applications. Why is that? Well, if you look at the infrastructure that many companies have, right, you see you've got SBC, session border controllers, you've got soft switches, you have desk phones, you may have carrier relationships you already have, have, have negotiated that you have. This is your existing infrastructure. But when you look forward and the problems you're trying to solve and you look to the cloud, you see many things you can do, right? You want to incorporate WebRTC, perhaps, into your applications, communicate in the browser. Maybe you want to bridge into the world of mobile Right, and allow connectivity of voice calls from inside mobile apps for iOS, Android, iPads, anything. You know, maybe you want to reuse programming languages or business logic you already have to program communications. Maybe you want to expand globally and tap into Twilio's inventory of 40 countries around the world where you can buy phone numbers and wire them up to applications. Or maybe it's just you want the agility of software, the ability to move fast, the ability to own your roadmap. These are the many things people are doing in the cloud with software-defined communications, but what's missing is the bridge, and that's what SIP provides. It's the bridge between what you currently have and what you want. And that's why we've invested so much in our SIP infrastructure. So let me show you how it works. Uh, as you're familiar, SIP out lets you dial from Twilio into your SIP-based applications, right? And it's very simple. Just like you might say dial a phone number, well, you just say dial a SIP address, and it just works connects into your SIP infrastructure. The other way is also true. It's very simple now to receive <coughs> SIP traffic from your old carrier, from your on-prem gear. Uh, and we introduced the notion of what we call SIP domains. That's how we do it, SIP domains. What SIP domains let you do is create a, uh, a domain name, right? Your company, .sip .com. And then you can point any SIP traffic that comes into that domain at a URL of your choosing, right? A Twimble URL that lets you program, that lets you use any language you want, runs on your servers, and lets you program whatever application logic you want. Whether it's a call center, whether it's some other application, right? So you just point it at your URL, you take your domain, you point it at the URL of your choosing, it runs on your servers, and it works just like any other Twimble application you've ever built using real phone numbers, right? And that's the power of being able to use SIP plus phone numbers all together in one. 
these SIP domains are very powerful. And what, one of the things that uh, we thought about when we introduced SIP domains was the ability to uh, secure it as well. So in addition to launching SIP domains, you see IP authentication. That lets you restrict what IP addresses can connect into your SIP domains. And you can restrict it to just your office, just your data center, just your IP blocks can connect in. But the, uh, we also said you could use uh, user credentials. So you can also secure it via user uh, credentials, or usernames and passwords of your users. And you can mix and match. You can use both together if you want. Any way that your security system works, you can use. And we've got web and APIs to configure this thing. So if you're an ISV, right, you've built applications, you can use APIs to configure them on the fly per your customer's settings. And this is, of course, live today. So two-way SIP connectivity, full duplex SIP connectivity is the bridge, it's that mechanism to achieve the hybrid between your old infrastructure and your new infrastructure. That's what we're so excited about launching SIP and excited to have the full product out there as of about a month ago. So we see a lot of people uh, in the audience, a lot of people here in the UK and across Europe who've been using this already. We're really excited to see what you build using SIP to bridge your past into your future. All right. Now, software-defined communications, interestingly, isn't just voice. Right? That's one part of it. We've talked a bit about voice already and call centers and phone calls and all that kind of stuff. But you know what's interesting? When we launched Twilio in 2008, we just had voice. We had phone numbers. We could make and receive phone calls with it. <coughs> one of the first things we heard from customers was they wanted SMS, too. They wanted to use those phone numbers to send and receive SMS messages. And so we did that, and in 2009, we brought our messaging product to market. And what's interesting is when we launched SMS in 2009, a whole lot of people said, SMS, there's no room for innovation there. It's 160 characters. How can you innovate in the world of SMS? That's dead, dead technology, right? But we listened to customers, and we found out something interesting. You guys have customers all around the world. And so the next thing we did is we added global messaging. The ability to text with people in uh, 1,200 carriers in 198 countries around the world, all via just one API. One API with global reach, as we like to say. So people said, there's no room for innovation. Screw that. And then we kept listening. We said, what's next? Well, people said, well, you know, SMS, text messaging, 128 ASCII characters, right? There's no room for innovation there. It's just 128 characters. We all know the ASCII character set. But you know what? You're communicating with customers everywhere in the world. And so we added Unicode to the product so that you could communicate in the language where your customer is. And we spent a lot of time making Unicode work, every character set, everywhere around the world. And we added, you know, we supported Chinese, Arabic, even emoji for the native emoji speakers around the world. And since we launched that just about a year and a half ago, you guys have proved this thesis right. right? You've got customers everywhere in the world. And since that time, since we launched this a year and a half ago, you have used over 16,000 Unicode characters in your applications, representing every language, every character set, every uh, form of text known to man you guys have used in your applications. That's really impressive. Your customer bases truly are global. So that's text messaging, right? People say, oh, well, is there anything like that? There's no room for innovation left. There's nothing more to do. SMS is dead, right? Well, well, it's another problem, right? We all know SMS. Limitation of 160 characters, right? 160 character limit. Even less if you use Unicode with multi-byte characters, right? And keeping track of your message, Right, keeping track of your message, making sure that it fits into one SMS, especially if you have variable length content, is very hard. If you have variable substitution, put someone's name in there or some order number. Right? 160 character limitation turns out to be pretty challenging for developers. And so you can imagine the applications of, of how they end up working and the code you have to write to make them work correctly. Right? You know, if you take a, you know, let's say you're, you're, you're uh, texting here with uh, Will, your good friend Will Shakespeare, and um, you know, you start to have a, uh, a, a, a soliloquy here, and uh, 160 characters doesn't quite cut it, right? So you're a developer, you say, okay, well, you know, I don't have to solve that. I'm going to try to do splitting into multiple messages. But you still can't get the whole thing in there, and you've got all this logic in your application, you know, message one of two, and it gets really hard to read. 
Right? That's pretty hard as a developer to figure out how to do that, to split your messages up and make that work properly. But we've seen people do that. The other thing we've seen people try to do is uh, you know, convince their users to come up with more condensed content. Um, tell them to just, can you speak? You know, can you use fewer characters here? And uh, you know, that's one approach. But um, you know, we don't think you should ask your users to, to uh, change the beautiful nature of their words. And so we're really excited because last month, we launched a product that we call concatenated SMS. It lets you send Twilio 1,600 characters, 10 times the 160 character limit. And what we will do is we will reassemble that message on a device. We'll take it, deliver it in 10 separate messages, and reassemble it on the device, where the carrier supports it and where the device supports it. And so your message just gets through, as you'd expect. One message that just looks like what you intended it to be. So it's the 1600 character limit and the smart reassembly that we're constantly working with carriers around the world and the device manufacturers around the world to make it so that that presentation, what you originally wanted the, the user to see, is what they see on that device. So we're really excited about concatenated SMS. It means that as a developer, you just hand your content to Twilio and we do the right thing. And every day, we're adding more and more carriers and more and more devices to that list. It gets better every day behind the scenes. You just hand us the content you want. So that's concatenated SMS. But that works around the world. Let's talk about the UK for a minute. You know, we launched here in, in 2011, just about two years ago, a little under two years ago, is when we first came to the UK. And what we did, we launched with two products. We had geographic numbers and we had pre-phone numbers. These two types of phone numbers. So let's talk for a minute about geographic numbers. When we uh, came here, we launched, we had, a, uh, we had an event here in London, but since that time, we've continued to expand the coverage of our phone numbers around the UK. And today, we're excited to say that we've got over 90% coverage of the UK population with 90% of the UK city codes uh, in inventory at all times with Twilio's phone number API. That's really exciting. And we also have coverage in 25 countries around Europe. So we're really excited at how we've expanded the product here. But you know, there's one problem that we've seen with geographic numbers, right? We have uh, text messaging on these geographic numbers. And we've had that since the day we launched. We've had it for about two years. And you guys have used it in many creative ways. And you've built many applications on top of these geographic numbers that use SMS. But one of the things that we've heard is that you know, customers don't always understand that you can text these numbers. Because right? they're geographic numbers. And usually you don't interact via text message with a geographic number. And so while, yes, we can send and receive messages, it is not a natural interaction for our users. So today we're solving that. And today we're announcing the launch of mobile numbers here in the UK. And we are really excited. <laughs> yes, thank you. We are really excited to be bringing mobile numbers here to the UK. Why? Because that's the native way in which you would imagine interacting via SMS with an application or with somebody. When a user gets the text from you, they don't wonder, wait, what, what's going on here? Right? This is the right, the best way to do it, and we're excited to be announcing this today. And so this is live. Uh, we've got a, a beta going on that anybody can go and sign up for uh, here in the UK. So we're really excited to bring this to market, but you know what? Uh, in the UK is not the only group that's getting mobile numbers. In fact, we've got six countries in Europe that we are launching this beta today for mobile numbers for people not just in the UK, but across the continent as well. We're really excited. Poland, Finland, Belgium, Sweden, Norway, and the UK are all getting mobile numbers to start building applications with this native mobile experience for text messaging. So we're really excited. The uh, URL to go to, if you want to get into the beta, twilio.com slash international slash beta. And uh, we can't wait to see what you're going to build on top of these mobile numbers. And by the way, these six countries are just the beginning. So we're just getting started providing mobile numbers in the UK and across the continent. We're really excited to be bringing this new product to you guys. And Europe, by the way, is the first market where we've brought mobile numbers. Um, so we can't wait to see what, what you build. See, like, excitedly loading the pages here in the front row. <laughs> so, one of the other things we found, right, since we've been here, right, we just launched mobile numbers. 
And you've got mobile numbers. Now you can send and receive text messages from now, not just geographic numbers, but also mobile numbers. And that's really exciting. But one of the things we found when we talk to customers, they say, yeah, that's great, but you know what? That's a whole lot of numbers, <laughs> right? That's a whole lot of numbers for me to try to communicate to somebody. Imagine a billboard saying, hey, text this number, right? Causes a lot of car accidents. <laughs> and, uh, and so one of the things that we found in the United States is that we have solved this problem with short codes. And in the United States, Twilio sells 70% of the short codes in the United States. It's because we've made it easy. We've made it simple. And today, we're doing the exact same thing here in the UK. Short codes in the UK are live today in public data. <laughs> So what this does is it provides you guys the ability to not just use phone numbers, but also short codes. And there's a number of advantages of short codes over long, uh, over long codes, right? With phone numbers, you can get started quickly. But when you want to do a large scale marketing campaign, when you want to reach a lot of people, or when you want that message to be short and tidy, short codes are the way to go, right? It's perfect for marketing use cases. It's a short, memorable, they can be branded, right? A lot of things that you can do with short codes. Put them on billboards, put them on placards, put them on the back of uh, product literature, right? And you know that people just have a few numbers to remember. Also, they're higher throughput than phone numbers are, right? So you can actually blast messages at a very high throughput, uh, unlike phone numbers. And that beta is live today. So we're really excited to see how many of your applications uh, are going to be built using mobile numbers or using short codes because all these things that we're building, all these things are designed so that you can build the right application to service your customer the right way. That's why we built all these things because you know what, fundamentally we believe it is good to build and that's what we're building to help you guys do every day. So we're excited to bring all these things to you guys. Now, I got one other thing I wanted to talk about. So we all know it's good to build. We're builders here. We're software people. We're doers. But in addition to saying it's good to build, I want to talk about something similar but related. Not it's good to build, but the notion of building for good. In fact, since we started Twilio, right, we've seen people build call centers and marketing applications and all sorts of neat things, opening a garage door with a text message and Arduinos, right? We see people building everything that you can imagine. But one of the most exciting areas that we see is people building for good. People building a better world, not for profit, but for the sake of a better world. Developers are great at identifying problems in the world, picking up their tools, and building software to help improve that world. Nonprofits. NGOs, and even self-organizing initiatives to respond to world events. We see developers doing that every day, picking up their tools and making the world a better place. Things like last year in New York after Hurricane Sandy, when the New York tech community came together, the New York Tech Meetup, a group they called themselves the Hurricane Hackers, and they built things like crowdsourced information hotlines on what was open and what was closed and who was safe and who maybe wasn't providing tools and IT support for New York businesses that were shut down because of the hurricane. Right? Hackers are doing amazing good in a time of need because they said they're sitting back and they're like, we don't want to sit back and be helpless and watch these events unfold. We want to use our skills as software people to have an impact. And we see that happening all the time. In fact, one of the most touching stories that, that we had occurred in this past year. And it was from this organization called Thorn. Thorn was founded by Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore. And they have a mission to use technology to fight child sexual, sexual exploitation. So they want to use technology to make children safe in our world. And one of the things that they found, one of the problems they're solving, is you know women around the world are abducted into the sex trade every day. And they are helping to find a way to help women get out of that situation. So one of the things they found is there is a hotline run by an organization called the Polaris Project in the United States. 
and they have a, a toll-free hotline that they advertise for women who are in the sex trade who need help, call this phone number. We'll help you get out. And they man a 24 by 7 call center in case uh, for when women call that number. But an interesting thing that they found, women were not calling as much as they wanted. And when they dug in and they talked to women who had been rescued, they found out why. Women who are, are captives of the sex trade don't have their own phones. They have to borrow a phone from their pimp and make a phone call to communicate with customers. And so if you call the toll-free phone number of the hotline to get help, to get out, your pimp's going to see that in the call log. And there are dire consequences if you get caught trying to make that phone call. So women were not calling. But they realized a text message could work. Because you can text discreetly. And you can delete the conversation from the phone when you're done. And so they contacted us last year and they said, we want to build an SMS call center for women to discreetly be able to get help and get out of the sex trade. We said, wow, what an amazing use case for this technology. And so together last year with Thorne, the Polaris Project, and the Salesforce Foundation, we worked to help make this a reality. And we launched it earlier this year with them. And uh, a woman from, Polaris, uh, from the Polaris Project spoke at our TwilioCon uh, just last month in San Francisco. And she told the amazing story, the power of a single text message. They got a text message one night from a woman who said she was in a hotel room. She had borrowed the pimp's phone, went into the bathroom. He thought she was communicating with a customer. She texted this hotline, and she said, that she needed help. So the uh, call center, the Players Project, contacted local police. And within two hours, police were breaking down the door of the hotel room. They took the pimp into custody. And that woman is now free of a life of sex trade. Right? And this is an amazing story. Yeah, it is. And what's even more amazing is that the day she sent that text message, she had been in the sex trade for two years. And it was her 18th birthday. And so when we as a company hear stories like that, and we see the amazing things that people are doing, we say, how can we make sure that organizations who are doing such great things in the world are able to use technology to advance those goals? And the problem was it wasn't systematic, right? You shouldn't need Ashton Kutcher to reach out in order to be able to use technology to make the world a better place. Right? We had people who contacted us saying, oh, I think my brother-in-law's college roommate works at Twilio. Maybe we can contact them. Right? You shouldn't need a hookup to do good in the world. And so that's why we launched Twilio.org. Twilio.org is our vehicle to help people doing great things in the world use the power of communication to further their goals. In fact. We have a goal with Twilio.org. We want to partner with nonprofits. And our goal in that partnership is to send a billion messages for good. A billion communications, every single one of which is making the world a better place. And we're partnering with organizations who are doing this around the world. Because we know, as we just heard from Thorne, even a single text message can be life-changing for people who know those problems and who are addressing those problems in the world. A billion messages for good. That's our goal, right? We're doing this because we believe that nonprofits, NGOs, all of these organizations deserve the best technology in the world to address the world's problems. And this is a way that we can coordinate that effort. Make it so that every nonprofit, every organization doing good knows that they can work with us to help solve those problems. Systematically address at scale the needs of nonprofits. So, how does it work? Well, if you're a nonprofit, you can go to Twilio.org and you can sign up. It's as easy as signing up for Twilio. And, all, uh, and how it works is after you sign up, first of all, you get $500 in Twilio Kickstarter credits. 
help you get running, help you get off the ground. And then, after you've used up those credits, as you get to scale, we provide an ongoing 25% discount on all of Twilio products forever for your messages, your calls, so that you can know that you can get started and you know that uh, we will uh, be there to support you as your use case scales, as your impact in the world is scaling. So it's the bundle of Kickstarter credits and the, and the lifelong discount that helps companies or helps nonprofits get started. And uh, any qualified nonprofit is eligible. Right? We're not picking and choosing. Any nonprofit can go to Twilio.org, sign up. All we're going to do is validate your nonprofit status, and you're off and running with the discount and the credits. And so we're really excited to get Twilio.org into the world, to be able to put our resources behind helping you, people doing great things in the world, using your software skills, using your development skills to make a difference. We're really excited to be helping you out. And we can't wait to see what you're going to build for good. So overall, everything we launched today, everything that we're doing, <coughs> we do it for you guys. Because you guys are the doers. You're the software people. You are making a difference in the world for your customers, for your companies. So everything that we've launched, everything that we've done, the app monitor, the request inspector, the app monitor alerts, full duplex SIP, mobile numbers here and on the continent, UK short codes, with all of these things, we cannot wait to see what you guys are going to build in the remainder of 2013 and into 2014 when we're here next for uh, the next TwilioCon Europe. We are so excited to be here. We are so excited for a day full of content to learn from people who've been building amazing things here in the UK and across Europe. Um, we hope you guys are inspired. We hope you guys learn some things. We hope you get some new ideas because we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of excitement ahead in the next year. So thank you very much for coming today and have a great, great time.